Papua. After the Pan-African class, we're going to have the Pan-African history class with uh, Dr. Tyrone Wright. So stay tuned. Yes, uh, we are going to have our first uh, speaker and uh, he's going to help us with a prayer in uh, his local language. Yes, Isaac, Wani, can you hear us? Uh, yes, Isaac, can you hear us? You can unmute yourself. Okay, I think they're having uh, some issues with uh, their microphone, but let's go ahead and uh, pray. Let's pray. We take a man and see some. When you put some very piece of the way, talking to them, go, commiss on your pay, commiss to go to the same. The children in the whole study to hear me, the shaman, the material for us, to hear you, the shots, and to imagine the same place of Christo. Amen. Yes, yes. Yes, we're going to have our first uh, speaker. Yes, Isaac, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear clearly. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, you have uh, two minutes to present your report. Okay, thank you. Uh, I love Black people family. This is Isaac from Juba, South Sudan. Uh, I greet you all in the, in the name of Allah Jesus Christ. As yes, I'm going to present, uh, this is uh, the, my, the topic is uh the importance of preserving and promoting african languages as a means of cultural preservation and identity uh we understand that uh, we are mainly talking about africa Africa, uh, when we talk about its location it's in southern part of europe between the atlantic and uh with almost uh with almost a uh, 1.5 billion population uh, and, and it also, also contains like uh, almost uh, 2000 different uh, languages that exist in the continent and with different cultural uh, uh, heritages. And when we talk about the uh, importance, we need to first also understand uh, what, what, what difficulties uh, are these people facing, like uh, we Africans, what are we facing for us to not be able to uh, make sure that we follow our cultural beliefs in terms of uh, retaining our languages? Uh, we said due to urbanization, we understand as countries are de developing, new things are coming in, our languages are fading off because our uh, elders, uh, traditional leaders are not trying their best in terms of educating the young, young people. And also we understand there are some also bodies, like there was a study done by UNESCO in 2012. Uh, they just uh, like, they, what they found out, that, out is that we Africans, like uh, majorly in, in Nigeria, that the language is now becoming like Igbo language that uh, the people are now becoming more many in the in the in the continent more people are learning like 25 million people speakers of this language so they are trying just to reduce the yes. use of uh, uh, 30 seconds left pardon yes 30 seconds left you can uh, finish up your report okay ah uh, now, when we come to the major point that we are talking about is uh, we say that uh, while, while there are many de debates ab about the values of preserving African languages on examination, it is clear that the benefit of doing so far overweighs the cost. For instance, let's look at the, the goals of the continent, socioeconomic and GDP growing growth that are closely linked to the contributions made by the workers, workforce of the country. The current but begun youth population are Africa's population. Uh, future potential work workforce. A decade from now, this youth demo demographic with either have been asset or burden to the continent, depending mm -hmm. on the factors such as education and impact. Yes, uh, thank you, Isaac, for uh, that wonderful report. Thank you for uh, sharing it with us. I am because you are. Up next, we're going to have our brother uh edwin chamber from uh, tanzania yes edwin chamber can you yes thank you thank you so much can you hear me yes we can hear you yes thank you, you so much two minutes to present your report 
Thank you so much. Uh, <clears throat> as you said, my name is Edwin Chamba, and today I'll be reporting about importance of preserving and promoting African languages as means of cultural preservation and identity. As we know, the language is a principal method for human communications. In Africa, it is an element of culture and a, it is an important com communication media. Our language in Africa is always our identity. It is, it is our language which makes us communicate easily. Our language can be verbal or nonverbal, as it can be further explained. Language is an crucial means for preservation and proper communication. And at the same time, it's a means of interaction. Language influences attitude and behavior, which are tools, main tools for culture changes. Language sometimes in societies should be preserved in some ways, including recording and creating printed sources, teaching and talking. We, we need to, to use our language mostly in different ways so that our language can grow faster in our, lang in, in our communities and societies. So another way of preserving language is using digital and social media outlets. Language consisting of speaking and sometimes it's a, it is a net, natural value. And language have cultural, spiritual, and emotional implications in societies beyond the communication. Language have much to do with community and cultural changes. Language is written or spoken so it are arts form and are ways yeah. for values and tradition to be passed yeah. down. Okay, okay. Thank you. Languages are important as preservation in invaluable wisdom, tradition, knowledge, and expression of art and beauty in societies. Privile preserving language in indigenous languages is important to to ensure the protection of cultural identity and the dignity of indigenous peoples and the safeguard of their traditional heritage. Thank you, because my time is off. I'll see you next time. Thank you. I am because we are. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Edin Chamba. I am because we are. Thank you for that wonderful report. Yes, up next, we are going to have uh, our brother, Abubakar Makalu. Uh, from uh, Sierra Leone. Yes, Abubakar, can you hear us? You can uh, unmute yourself. I think they have an issue with uh, their mic. Yes, up next, we're going to have our brother. Uh, Fonte Pe. Yes, uh, Fonte Pe, can you hear us? You can unmute yourself. Yeah, one second. I can hear you. Okay, yes, welcome. Uh, you have uh, two minutes to present your report. Thank you. Uh, my fellow Pan Africans, I greet you all. I am called uh, Fonte Pe. And uh, I am from Cameroon. So it's my desire to reiterate my support for the implementation of the above of our above mentioned topic of discussion today, which is uh, the importance of preserving and promoting African language or languages as a means of cultural preservation and identity. Yeah, African languages are constantly in Moribon, as we all know as a result of the constantly, uh, sorry, as a result of a forceful inheritance of colonial languages. God himself was not a doldrum when establishing linguistic diversification among the human race. Foreign languages in most African nations have been uh, officialized at uh, the expense of our own culture. And we all know which has uh, re which has retarded technological, political, economic, and socio-cultural progress of the rich continent, which is our continent. Every product on planet Earth today has its manual, 
and uh, our culture or our language as Africans is an unsubstituted part of our own manner. You know, uh, a good case in point is uh, if you look at the Chinese, Arabs, Japanese, etc. You can name uh, any other example that you know who have uh, been able to enjoy a prolonged period of okay, which have been able to enjoy a prolonged period of growth, firstly because of language. They speak the same language. Everything that uh, are being taught, they are being taught from birth is in their native language. And we all know in their respective languages. There are examples. Uh, these are examples word emulating. We are supposed to copy some examples and we will experience an inevitable progress the moment we get rid of this ridiculous heritage and start doing things the African way. So thank you. I love Africa. I love its cultural diversity and I am because we are. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Fontefe. I am because you are. Thank you for that uh, wonderful report. Yes, up next, we're going to have our brother, Yemi Makochera uh, from Malawi. Yes, uh, Yemi, can you hear us? You can now uh, unmute yourself. Okay, I hope I'm audible enough. Yes, yes, we can hear you. Welcome. You have two minutes to present your report. Okay, thank you. I think uh, today is I want just to share my uh, reports on the uh, importance of having Okay, I'm here today to speak to you about a topic that is uh, very close to my heart, like the importance of preserving and uh, promoting African languages as a means of cultural uh, preservation and identity. Uh, Africa is a continent with over 5,000 different languages, making it the most uh, linguistically diverse continent on the planet. Unfortunately, despite this incredible diversity, African languages are under threat. The spread of uh, colonization uh, colonization, globalization and modern, modern modernization has led to a decline in the usage of uh, African languages. Uh, this has been a problem for a number of uh, reasons. The first one being uh, when languages dies, the culture or knowledge and heritage uh, that it contains dies with it. Uh, African languages are unique. They convey not only words, glamour, but they also convey people's history, tradition, and uh, beliefs. Language is a powerful tool for cultural identity, which, uh, which is why losing a language is a losing part of uh, one's identity. Languages form the best, uh, the basis of how we identify our culture. It shapes our traditions, our thoughts. Yes, uh, 30 seconds left. Hello? Yes, 30 seconds left. You can uh, finish up with your report. Okay, thank you. I think for giving me the floor. Yes, uh, that was our brother Yami Makuchera from Malawi. Thank you for that uh, uh, wonderful report. Yes, I am because you are. Up next, we're going to have uh, uh, our brother Abubakar Wakalu from uh, Sierra Leone. Yes, Abubakar, can you hear us? You can uh, unmute yourself. Um, good afternoon to you all. Um, yes, good afternoon. This is Abu Karma. Yes. I'm, I'm from the Gambia, yeah, not Sarian. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yes, you it's have two minutes to present your report. Yeah, it is a great place for, um, 
to, to join in this uh, joint call. Um, uh, my request here, right? the language is internal uh, part of culture and the people culture should be considered when disseminating information for public. So the culture could be considered as some thought of the people way of doing things, giving language. It is a part of the culture. There is no need information to be disseminated in the language that appeals to masses the identity of the country and uniques among the world, the nations of worldwide folk language used within the ge um, geographical, geographical borders. It is therefore necessary for the countries to develop, promote, preserve the national language, seeing the history has shown that the, the citizens has identified themselves through language, rather ge geographical boundaries, developing African language require government and grassroots support. For the maintenance of uh, the major challenge facing the, the development and the promotion and preservation of the, the African language that um, um, it, it, it requires the, 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 the challenge that we face in the, in the, in the preservation of our foreign, you know, um, our, our national language is that the, the, the psychological ones, the African leaders and in Africa have for long, mean, for long, marginalized the blank, blank, uh, Balakura speaking in the country, like by when you in school, when you speak Balakura, a language in, in school, like my school in, in here, um, in Gambia here, sometimes when I start speaking my language in school, the teachers always complain why I speak Balakura language in school. So this is something that hinder, uh, that is something that we face the challenge of the period, the of our culture, Yes, our, 30 our, seconds and, and also like, um, where we, uh, in fact, um, I, I have wide, uh, uh, I, I wrote to, to, to our Minister of Education in, in support of the introduction of our national language in the schools. But in fact, some others, you know, later they support me in, in the great idea of like, the, it needs like our national language to be introduced in school so that, you know, you know, students can be learn, you know, and preserve our culture. And in the Gambia here, certain some of the schools, they have to, like you know, Gambia, we have the yeah, multilingual language. We speak um, Flora, we speak Mandinka, we speak Wolof, and etc. Yes. So, uh, so certain schools they introduce, but, but other schools like uh, international schools uh, they don't allow you know what else. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, thank you. Okay. Uh, the time is not on our, on our side. Thank you. Okay, for okay, time. thank you, thank you. I, I have not got to go, but but thank you for having me. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Abubakar Makano from uh, the Gambia. Thank you for that wonderful right. report. Yes, I am. Yes, we are. Yes, thank you. Yeah. It's up, up next, we're going to have uh, uh, our brother, Amazing Grace Tebeka from Malawi. Yes, Amazing Grace, can you hear us? You can unmute yourself. Yes, amazing Grace. Can you hear us? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Yes, welcome. You have uh, two minutes to present your report. Okay, thank you once again for having an opportunity to present today. Uh, much on the topic has been presented by the brothers, the ambassadors from different countries. Um, I so I don't have to stretch much or find much what is language, what is culture. The presentations have been very clear, and uh, I'm just here now to just present on once we have of these cultures, we have heard about the importance of cultures and languages, different languages we speak in Africa and the different cultures and uh, that, that defines us black people. Uh, I, I just have to stress some few points uh, on how we can preserve this culture because uh, in as far as English 
uh, is dominating Africa, it means that as black people, we haven't uh, much concentrated on our languages. And this has led to, as language is a tool for development, is a tool for unity, is a tool for development, black people still um, find themselves marginalized uh, among the other races. Uh, language and culture are, 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 are entwined together. They work hand in hand. And la uh, language, uh, as it is said, uh, it is portrayed verbally as an, uh, action, by action and, uh, and uh, uh, through sign languages. If we promote this, like here we have the, we're having this presentation, we need to have a sign language for our friends who are part of our society, but who cannot speak. So the absence of this just uh, defines it all that we're feeling to. Left, we can uh, conclude. You can't hear me? Yes, we can hear you. 30 seconds oh. left, you can uh, conclude. Ah, okay, okay. So that's just to define the importance of language and how can we preserve uh, language and culture? This can be uh, preserved by teaching language classes, uh, using digital and social media outlets, uh, insisting on speaking our native languages in most of our meetings. This could promote our culture and language. And uh, by visiting uh, areas of, uh, of historical nature, this also can help us as Africans, as black people, to preserve uh, our language uh, and, and culture. Let me just finish by uh, by quoting um, one uh, one of the, uh, the the founders of Pan Africanism, uh, His Excellency, First President Julius Nyerere. He used to here to unite his country uh, after independence in Tanzania. This just stress that how important language and culture has been since the beginning of our history as, as, as black people. Yeah, thank you for that is what I have for today. I am because we are. Yes, thank you very much. I am because you are. That was uh, our brother, amazing place at the Baker from Malawi. Up next, we are going to have uh, our brother Shadrach Nunui. Uh, from uh, Cameroon. Yes, Shadrach, can you hear us? You can uh, unmute yourself. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon once more. Yes, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, yeah. thank you. Two minutes to present you. Okay. Okay, thank you once more for passing the floor. As, I, as it is being said, I'm from Cameroon. I'm called Nini Shadra. So the topic today was how can we preserve or promote our languages in order to preserve an identity for African culture. But for what I can say is that today we can now completely refuse the fact that of a of a philosopher once said that who is called Lady Green who said. Africa mentality is a primitive one. Today we can deliberately refuse that because based on our culture, and our languages, we can identify an Africa or even his dresses, the, even his way of behaving, the folkies, we can identify an Africa. And that at times when we even sit, if not of these are colonial languages, we always see Africans, they will talk into their primitive language. From there, we can know that African love where they come from. They love the spirit of fraternity, they love the spirit of, and they also define their, their way of being. Like we have some other philosophers, ethno philosophers, like ethno philosophy, which says that philosophy orally, that African use express yourself or define their way of being that uses their language. And for this one, can conclude that, or what can we say that as African use these languages to come to debate in, in elsewhere in the world. They are part of who they are, and this makes them to preserve their culture. And one that can conclude is that for these cultures, for these languages not to be to be missed in the in the future generation, as our brothers and colleagues said, 
that they need to be taught in school. Visit these historical places that are where our great great grandfathers came from. Because yes, we tend to be able to say. 30 seconds left, you can uh, complete. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, we turn today to say that our great grandfathers are elite. No, they are not elite of this new colonial language. They, are they, are, they know the existence of the, the primitive language. So we now today, we need to go back to them and search for those languages of which we, we call our maybe. contribute for this, how can we eat the prevent and what is the African language? Thank you very much. I'm grateful to attend this meeting of this. Thank you very much for coming once more everyone. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Shadrach Mimi. I am because you are. Thank you for sharing that uh, wonderful report with us. It's up next to have our brother, Eric Chilu. Chilufia from uh, Zambia. Yes, Eric, can you hear us? You can uh, unmute yourself. Yes, uh, I think they're having uh, some issues with the network. We are going to continue with our brother, uh, Mohamed Kamal. Yes, from Sierra Leone. Yes, Mohamed. You can uh, unmute yourself. Uh, we are going to continue with our brother, uh, Morai Sese. From Sierra Leone. Yes, Morai, can you hear us? You can uh, unmute yourself. Yes, brother Morai, you can uh, unmute yourself. If they are having issues with the, the microphone. I can see our brother Mohammed Kamara uh, joined the call again. Yes. Yeah, good. yeah, good everybody. Good everybody. My name is Mohammed Kamara. I'm from Sierra Leone. Yes, you have some minutes to yeah. the report. Yeah. Today, I'm glad you give me this opportunity to talk to this whole platform, to everyone in this platform. Today, I'm here to talk about the preserving and promoting of African language as a means of preservation of culture and identity. Thank you. For giving this particular topic, I have some I have five important ways in which we can we can preserve the African culture and also uh, preserve our identity as African. One is one of the way is the cultural preservation. The language is integral part of any culture, containing the value, the beliefs, tradition, and knowledge of the community. African language reflects to the unique cultural heritage, history, and wisdom of region and ethnic groups. By preserving and promoting African language, we ensure that the derived culture expressed and practice are passed down to the further future generation. That is one. Two, we we'll talk about what? We we'll talk about identity and self-esteem. Identity and self-esteem are also important ways in which we can use this African language to preserve our culture and 
our identity as African. One of the way, the language is a fundamental aspect of individual identity. It serves as a means of personal expression, communications, and connect to one's roots by preserving and promoting African culture. Hey, by preserving by preserving African culture, individual can maintain a strong sense of identity, pride, and self-esteem. It allows them to express their thoughts, emotion, and expression in their native tongue. It fosters a sense of belonging, culture, and communication. This is all I I gotta for this particular topic. Thank you to everyone. I am because we are. Yes, thank I am you. Because we are. Thank you very much, uh, Mohammed, for that wonderful report and the presentation. Yes, after that, we are going to have our, our brother, Cece. Yes, uh, Cece uh, Morai, can you hear us? You can uh, unmute yourself. Yes, uh, say, say, can you hear us? Yes, I think they are having a, a network issues. Yes, we are going to continue with the Pan-African Healthcare class with uh, Nana Akua Zenzele. And uh, if you would like to receive a shout out from her, you can uh, turn your camera on because she likes uh, giving lectures while watching beautiful black faces. Yes, uh, Nana Akua, welcome. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon. Greetings, everyone. Hey there, Curtis and Candice and Emmanuel and Nebby and Fawn. I think that's it. Oh, hey, sis, sis Iman. All right, I think that's everyone. Thank you all so much. Thank you. So thank you. Um, this is our, I think, eighth day. Hey, Chris, and who has popped on? Afori, yeah, Isaac. Give me this gift card. Oh, and somebody probably needs to mute there. Thing. So this is our eighth week uh, of this series of Pan-African Healthcare. And I believe I have pulled up what I want to talk about today. Yes, I did. I think you can see what I need you to see, hopefully, yes. Okay, so let me scroll back up to the top. So if you've been able to kind of catch most of the sessions um, this cycle, and I have a couple of different sets of information that I teach from. And so we've discussed what it is to practice holistic health care or what holistic healing um, is, how it uh, focuses on the mind, body, and spirit. We talked about what are some of the aspects of holistic healing, whether it's herbalism, whether it's nutrition, whether it's um, chiropractic care or massage therapy or uh, traditional sp spiritual healing, um, music therapy, other forms of touch therapy, reflexology, um, shiatsu, qigong, tai chi, um, all of these things, right? Um, we know that there are certain aspects to a healthy diet. We talked about some of the essentials uh, of nutrition, what our nutrients um, do for the body. They're like fuel for the body. You know, they are providing vitamins and minerals and carbohydrates and proteins and fats and oils. And 
water to the body, right? We talked about what the six essential um, nutrients are. Uh, so we've discussed in some detail some of the vitamins and minerals the body needs, ways to get protein, even plant-based proteins. We talked about um, not having a lot of sugar in the diet and some of the aspects to changing our diet. We talked about juicing and different forms of diets like macrobiotic diets, um, alkaline diets. Um, we've talked about stress release, things to do to... Uh, overcome stress or stressors that we have in our lives, how that impacts the body, how to manage our emotions with the flower remedies or the flower essences. Um, we talked about cleansing and detoxification, uh, the five paths of elimination and different herbs and foods that in fact cleanse those organs in the body. And so this last session, I wanted to uh, go over some additional information. I won't say miscellaneous, but some additional information that I think kind of will help tie some of these things together. Um, I want us to know how to address our health concerns and how to handle certain things that aren't necessarily emergencies. Um, ourselves. But of course, we sometimes, uh, well, not sometimes, we'll always need to know when we should, in fact, seek assistance, uh, help from other just friends, family, or help from professionals, depending on different situations. And so I, some years ago, uh, came uh, up with this personal care plan. Um, and so combining all the information that we've discussed and other information you of course may have already had, I thought it would be helpful to have a plan that you could you know, print out for yourself or anyone that you might be caring for to figure out what to do in different situations. Um, so if someone has a chronic situation, uh, an acute illness that occurs on a regular basis, this is something that can be written out for when my daughter has an asthma attack or when my blood sugar gets low or when I'm feeling really stressed uh, from work. Whatever situations you know cause or have an impact on your health or cause health uh, dis-ease or discomfort, I thought that this handout was helpful for. Uh, and so it's pretty self-explanatory. It's sort of a guide as to what to eat, what to drink, what supplements to take, what remedies to use, um, an assessment of how you usually feel during those times. You know, some of us feel really defeated or we feel really depressed or we feel really lonely. Um, how you feel is important because that is gonna help you combat the issue. Um, if you know that you have a problem feeling hopeful, <laughs> then you'll know that this is when you'll kick in the whole, who do I call? Who do I inform? Who will help me get through this? Um, things you do to help stay calm so that you can focus on your healing. Is it listening to music? Is it uh, watching TV? Is it doing a puzzle? If it, is it going for a walk? Um, is it drinking uh, an herbal tea? We, we talked about uh, sedative or herbal uh, calming teas uh, in one section. It, it could be any number of things, visiting your favorite place, a waterfall, going outside and sitting in nature and, you know, catching lightning bugs, <laughs> as I used to do as a child. I was at a festival recently. Uh, you all know I have a story for a lot of things. Um, me and my daughters went to a festival and the younger daughter, she's 13, uh, she saw lightning bugs, which I don't know. I can't imagine she's not seen them before, but I don't know, maybe she hadn't, um, and not to her memory. So she was going, what are these little things? And my older daughter, who's 20, was like, uh, you ain't never seen a lightning bug. And so I go to tell the story of how growing up, we used to catch lightning bugs in jars. And, you know, that was the excitement. <laughs> just that just catching lightning bugs um but whatever in the, but that brought back fond memories for me 
and I ended up catching one and I was holding it in my hand and she of course is terrified of any kind of bug so that was not really thrilling to her <laughs> but for me that brought a sense of calm and it of course it was very nostalgic because it brought back um, memories from my childhood so being out you know I'm a country girl being out in nature and catching bugs or playing with daddy long legs or whatever the case may be that is calming that uh brings me a sense of peace whatever it is I encourage you to tap into that figure that out um and do those things regularly, not just when you're not well, right? But especially when you're not feeling well, figure out what it is that really makes you happy, what calms you down. Is it breathing exercises? You know, do I need to take a breath? You know, some people only focus on that when they're angry and like, okay, let me take a breath because, you know, I'm about to be, you know, bad or I'm about to go off or turn up or whatever, right? We're saying these days. But even before these times, figure out what it is that makes you happy, what brings you joy. I was talking to someone just a few minutes ago, and sadly, this person said they've not really experienced happiness or joy. And uh, that, of course, is the root of all his problems, I imagine. Um, but to not even know what that is or what that feels like, then that's the first order of business. So even before trying to figure out, well, what to do when I'm sick or I'm not feeling well, figure out what makes you happy. So this question here is important. Uh, but also who to call when you know you're not well and you may need help or you may need encouragement or you may need some sort of support. Um, and then of course, knowing the situation and when it is in dire straits where you need to get assistance from a professional. Where and when do I go for help for this situation? Now we know that not every illness will you be able to pre-plan it, right? But if again, there is a chronic situation that you know will occur, um, whatever kind of flare up or outbreak or occurrence or attack that you may have from whatever illness you have, this is a way to prepare yourself for it, to ease you through it. Because we know that when we're in emotionally high states that we don't always think clearly. This will help focus you so that you can focus on your healing. In assessing what typically happens in the Black or African community, we know that certain conditions, we know that certain conditions um, are prevalent to our people and blood pressure is uh, one of those. So we know that, my apologies. Um, we know that there are these instances where we'll need to regulate uh, our blood pressure. If it is hereditary, it runs in our family, or if it's just from cultural uh, occurrences. We have high stress lives li living in this, on this planet as black people we know that there are certain conditions we may uh, face. So knowing how to identify um, and monitor our blood pressure, I think is very important. This chart, as you know, if you uh, listened or tuned into our classes before, I love this handout because it gives us a good uh, display and demonstration of what normal blood pressure is, right? So right here in this sort of yellow area, uh, well, not really, it's really this green area where it's normal blood pressure. We know that anywhere between 65 and 90 over 100 and 130 are going to be healthy blood pressures, right? We know that anything below this is low blood pressure, anything above this is going to be considered high blood pressure or hypertension. Um, we need to know what foods to avoid, what foods to include, what supplements are supportive in managing your blood uh, pressure. So we know, for example, let me make this a little bigger. So we know that no foods um, are things like high salt foods. We know that uh, medium salt foods should be avoided. We know that saturated fats should be avoided. Hydrogenated oils, uh, partially hydrogenated oils. Um, these are foods that should be avoided. 
hydrogenated oils. These are oils where they add hydrogen. They usually do these uh, processes to prolong the shelf life of these oils. You won't usually go and of course find a bottle of hydrogenated oils. This is, these are oils that are put into foods to uh, increase their shelf life. So a lot of cookies and cakes and snack foods. Um, processed foods that have a long shelf life, you'll find in their ingredients, hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated oils. We'll know that canned foods and these same uh, foods that are usually in the center of your grocery store that are on the shelf, they'll also have high salts. These are things that are used to preserve and, and lengthen the, the shelf life. And while in certain situations, if you're stocking up and doing certain things in emergency situations, you might certainly do these things at the bare minimum in emergency situations. But we know that often we want uh, to eat fresh, uh, healthy foods, not foods that have really sat around that are packaged in aluminum cans with high salt contents or are in a package that has a five to 10 year shelf life. These are not foods we want to consume on a daily basis. Our yes foods are foods that are high in vitamin uh, K, that are high in calcium and other uh, 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 vitamins and minerals. These are gonna be foods like apples, avocados, bananas, broccoli, fish, grapes, oats, um, orange juice, water, uh, I'm sure there are so many other foods. Celery, I would definitely add uh, to this list in regulating blood pressure. I think that that's a really good uh, food. Kale, I will probably mention a couple of other foods, but this handout highlights these foods, which are a good place to start. There are certain uh, vitamins and minerals and herbs and um, food supplements that are also going to be supportive in regulating your blood pressure. These are going to be things like your vitamins C and D and E, uh, your B complex. These are gonna be your minerals like calcium, magnesium and potassium. These are gonna be herbs like hawthorn and garlic. Uh, and again, we could add more to those, juniper berry. Um, we can you know, start here. Uh, foods like flaxseed oil and your deep sea fish oils or cod uh, liver oils, um, your amino acids like CoQ10 and um, I, uh, carnitine, uh, carnitine. These are going to be supplements that are going to be good for you as well. We know that certain habits or routines should also be avoided like um, smoking, uh, having excess weight, um, not exercising, these are things you should avoid. Um, lack of sleep, um, you know, these are all things that we want you to be mindful of. These can impact your blood pressure. So we want you to uh, not do caffeine if possible, if so, very little. Um, we want you to get sufficient rest. We want you to get sufficient exercise uh, and just be able to really manage your stress levels and your weight. Uh, there are some other details. They talk about the stages of blood pressure and things like this. Again, I think this handout was very um, helpful. The website is listed here um, for more information. I thought this was a very helpful uh, even though it's a little dated, but it's a very helpful uh, handout. Another issue that Black people, we tend to have issue with is diabetes or the inability to regulate our blood sugar. So I feel like one of the best ways to do that is to know and understand the glycemic index. This um, chart is a measurement uh, it's a value assigned to foods based on how slowly or how quickly the foods cause an increase in your blood glucose levels, right? Um, foods low on the glycemic index um, will tend to release glucose slowly and steadily. Foods high on the glycemic index release glucose rapidly. So the low um, uh, glycemic index foods tend to foster weight loss, while high glycemic index foods um, help with energy recovery after exercise or to offset hypo or insufficient glycemia. So 
they both will have a use or a purpose, but you really, really have to be mindful, especially if you're diabetic, pre-diabetic. My rule of thumb is to generally focus on avoiding your high glycemic foods um, and really focusing on foods that are lower glycemic or moderately gl glycemic. You'll find many different charts for this. There are books on the glycemic index. You can Google and find various charts, but basically it's a good way to know what are typically high glycemic foods. And this chart kind of goes through some of the grains and such that are high glycemic uh, and then some that are lower glycemic. So if you are, and, and pretty much um, you'll find here just your, your grains, your uh, sweeter fruits, your root vegetables, of course, your cereals, your candy bars, your snacks, things like that. Foods that do have um, uh, a high glycemic uh, or, or a carbohydrate content at all. You won't necessarily find your vegetables, uh, green leafy vegetables and things like that on a glycemic index at all because they really don't have a uh, carbohydrate um, number that's sufficient uh, to make note of. But if you're trying to figure which cereals to eat, um, even if it's something that's a little less healthy than others, you know, you'll be able to pick what is gonna be a better option. Here, you'll see that certain fruits are going to be listed, but some that are lower glycemic, you'll see are under 70. The higher ones are going to be over 70. Right, so we know that uh, melons and mangoes and things like that are generally your higher glycemic, your more fibrous fruit like apples, um, berries, some of your citrus, these are gonna be your lower fruits. We know that the root vegetables are going to be the higher glycemic uh, vegetables, um, whereas again, your leafy greens are usually not gonna even be registered on uh, the glycemic chart at all. Uh, choose wisely in terms of your dairy products, uh, your beans and things of that, your legumes. These are generally going to be lower glycemic as well. And again, they list here some, some snack foods so that you can choose wisely as to which ones of these. Sugar becomes a big, or sweeteners in general become a big issue, right? So we know that uh, your regular table sugar, your sucrose, or foods that will have glucose in them. These are generally always going to be higher than 70. I even questioned this honey listing here. Generally, honey is over 70. Perhaps a raw local honey is going to be a decent option, but generally your fructose, your um, uh, xylitol, your agave, your monk fruit, your stevia, these are going to be your lower glycemic um, sweeteners. These are going to be your better options than some of these other sweeteners. I think some other good things to note in terms of managing your health is to just know what foods um, will contain certain substances that will cause uh, candida or parasites or mercury or heavy metals and things of this in your body. I think these are going to be a good um, set of tools to, to manage. Okay, do I have excess yeast or candida in my body? Um, this might be from uh, medications that you take. Um, this might be from certain illnesses or conditions that you have. Um, and it really helps to um, give you indication of whether or not you're likely to have, a, say, a systemic candida or a systemic yeast condition. We know that this is not this does not just apply to women when we're talking about vaginal yeast infections. There are men and women that can have candida or candidiasis, where you have too much yeast in the bloodstream and it will cause certain conditions. It might cause excess weight. It may cause uh, skin breakouts or rashes that'll look like adult acne. It may cause severe um, dandruff in the scalp that might look like cradle cap that babies get. Uh, it may cause mood swings. Um, 
any number of conditions and not just a localized vaginal infection in a woman. So anyone who is having, say, a high glycemic, you know, uh, uh, food regimen, um, it could also be people who have HIV or AIDS, people, so in addition to diabetes or HIV and AIDS, it could be uh, folk who take certain types of medication. There are just certain conditions where you may uh, have candida in your system and you will need to be able to identify that. Oh, I didn't mention the abdominal uh, distension or bloating. So there's so many uh, symptoms that you may have. Again, most people think of yeast and they only think of women. It is not just a condition for women. And there are different protocols, of course, in terms of how to treat the can, um, candida. Uh, there's a candida-free diet, you can Google. Uh, most times it's about cutting out sugar and it's about killing off the yeast and having a healthy diet that supports candida-free um, uh, living. And, and sometimes that can be strenuous, but it's all about using that glycemic index chart and really cutting out your sugars, especially um, unnatural sugars, synthetic sugars and your maltodextrins and your glucose and sucrose and all of that that you'll find in a lot of prepackaged foods. Another common issue that people have is parasites. Uh, parasites is a big issue, but most people are more, uh, I'll say, consumed with the concept of parasites. I feel like Candida is probably more popular than parasites because I used to say the standard American diet, but a lot of our diets, the standard African diet, the standard American diet um, is very starchy. And uh, we're more prone to, I believe, having uh, excess yeast in our bodies. But there are occasions where you may in fact have an overgrowth of parasites. Um, there are definitely some natural practitioners that feel like cancer is directly linked to parasites. Um, certainly if you do a lot of gardening, uh, especially if you are out in soil barefoot or you live in certain environments to where there are just certain parasites that are in your area. Um, definitely if you're eating certain meats and raw uh, fish or uncooked uh, meats, there's the likelihood of these types of things. But these are some of the common symptoms of parasites. And we know that there are also many uh, herbs that will kill off parasites, uh, wormwood, uh, black walnut hull, um, myrrh, golden seal. Uh, these are some of the stronger uh, herbs that kill parasites. Um, these will not usually be pleasant um, <laughs> tasting uh, herbs, but they do a great job. Um, and it's always a good idea if you actually um, have any of these symptoms or if you have a lifestyle like I previously discussed, or if you're battling cancer, never going to be a bad idea to do a parasite cleanse. The handout here, I think is just a good recap of sort of what we have talked about, I think throughout. And I gave sort of that little overview uh, at the beginning, but I think it's important for us to have a definition of what wellness is, uh, what it means physically, what it means emotionally, spiritually, um, understanding again, some of those areas of holistic healing that I mentioned, some of those natural healing modalities. Um, and I didn't reiterate, but let me do this here. Most naturalists uh, believe that there are two causes of disease. One is toxicity and the other is malnutrition. And if you are addressing those two issues, usually you're going to be in the ballpark of addressing your health concerns. Um, it's either some toxin that's in the body that needs to be cleansed. Uh, and we talked about detox, that's either, either uh, cleansing or ridding the body of a toxin or uh, mitigating its effect, right? You know, stabilizing its impact on the body. So doing some type of detox or cleansing 
uh, or purification of the body or adding and or adding uh, the proper nutrition. Uh, so if the body is void of certain uh, nutrition that it needs to uh, be strong and healthy and vital, uh, then we need to evaluate what it is that we're putting into our bodies and making sure that we're getting the proper nutrition. We know some of the basic concepts are having enough water in the right types of water, uh, alkaline water, distilled water. Um, these are my preferences. Um, half your weight in ounces, if you were going by pounds. Um, I know in some parts of the world they use... Uh, kilos and uh, now I forget liters, right? But half your weight in ounces based on how many pounds you are. So if you are 180 pounds, then you should have at least 90 ounces of water a day. Uh, but good quality, as high quality as you can find. And again, I know also in parts of the world, good quality water is, is hard to find. So if you are at very least able to filter out impurities from the water with some good filtration system, the highest quality water you can find is going to be essential to your overall well-being. Stress, managing stress is going to be key. We will always have stress. It is just as constant as change. As we know, everything will change. We know that we will encounter stress. And so we have to employ uh, ways in which to address the stress, eliminate it when possible, or at least, again, mitigate it so that it does not have a negative uh, impact on us. Food and diet, we've talked in detail about that. I'm not so much big on saying, oh, don't eat any meat uh, or don't eat this or don't eat that, but making sure that the diet plan that you are following is uh, limiting how much sugars you're taking in, being predominantly alkaline um, and eating as fresh and unprocessed as possible, I think are going to be some basic guidelines to follow. If you choose to do uh, vegetarianism, or um, if you're choosing macrobiotic, or if you're implementing juicing, um, or any of these specific diets, uh, veganism, uh, some people are, are fruitarians, you know, it, there are so many different types of diets, but some basic principles of kind of what to eat is eating fresh, e eating locally. Um, unprocessed, limiting your, your sugars, um, the types of fats. Um, these are going to be some good um, ideals for you in terms of diet. Exercise and movement, you know, it's almost like sleep and sleep should be on this list as well, right? There's no replacement for sleep and there's no replacement for movement. We have to move our bodies. We have to get proper exercise, even if it's marching in place even if it is basic calisthenics where we're moving, um, we can be doing arm circles, you know, or arm lifts and leg lifts. It can be basic. It does not have to be complicated, does not have to be in a gym, but getting outside, enjoying the fresh air and walking, uh, it can be climbing your steps. It can be parking further away from, you know, the door uh, entrance of a store, taking the steps rather than the elevator. Um, it can be incorporating breathing exercises uh, along with your physical movement of your parts, um, external parts movement, but all of these types of exercises are important. We've talked about detoxification, cleansing all of the uh, paths of elimination, not just the colon. We need to address the liver, the kidneys, the lungs, the skin, uh, and what did I leave out? Colon and the colon. <laughs> now, now I forgot about the colon. I'm saying don't just do the colon and then I forget about the colon, but we have to address all of those paths of elimination. Uh, and then again, emotional health, Emo how you feel, how you, know, you actually feel and really knowing how you feel and managing our emotions are going to be very important as well. We, we have to keep track of how we feel, 
whether we're full of fear or anger or loneliness or sadness or despondency or whatever it is, we have to uh, balance our emotions. The flower remedies are excellent for that. This is sort of out of place. This mercury chart should have been up there with the candida and parasite chart. But also this is another way of evaluating your health is whether there's mercury in the body and there's certainly um, mercury-free diets or mercury detox diets that one can follow. Uh, to cleanse the body of excess mercury from amalgams in our dental work or from certain uh, fish, um, depending on where it's been uh, caught. So there are different ways and reasons that we come in contact with mercury. So this is a chart to help us figure out if that's an issue for us. And so these were just sort of some highlights, uh, a recap, if you will, of what we've talked about in this class and some things to consider to make your health um, better and to improve your state of living. Uh, so join us next time as we get a new cycle or, or the same. We welcome you to continue always. Hopefully there's always some good information that's shared that wasn't maybe shared previously. So keep coming back and hopefully you'll get more information. And as always, I thank you for joining us and I bid you good health and peace. Yes, uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Nana Kua, for this uh, wonderful lecture. Uh, enjoy the rest of your weekend and a uh, happy new month. Thank you. Yes, uh, we are going to continue with the Pan African um, history class with uh, Dr. Tyreen Wright. Yes, Dr. Wright. Hi, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Give me one second to get on camera. Uh, so yes, we are approaching the end and, uh, this week, so last week I actually gave you the documents while we were in class, which was the first and fifth Pan-African Congresses, along with the document by Nkrumah, Osage Kwame Nkrumah, his, uh, speech to the, uh, African, well, the OAU, okay, at the initiation of the Organization of African Unity. So I want to talk a little bit about that today and what that ultimately should mean for us in terms of the work that you're doing uh, with I Love Black People. Give me a moment to get on camera. I'm coming to it. <laughs> it just took me a second this morning. But um, so one of the things I want to say in the meantime is that you should be uh, holding on to these documents. I think I stated it last time because things like um, things like uh, the resolutions for the first and fifth Pan African Congresses are documents that you could get, but you know there might be a little challenging to get. Okay, so it's not something you will come across uh, just on an everyday basis, but I have put them up there for you to uh, utilize and evaluate. And so um, if you have gotten to the end here with us, then hopefully you're, you have compiled the documents uh, offline for your own purposes to refer back to it. I'm sorry, I'm just looking for my Oh, okay. I was looking for the stand for my camera. Okay. All right. So, um, so those are the main items that I wanted to uh, tell you before we get started. And, uh, and you should see me in a second here. Okay. So I'm sorry. Sorry, guys. <laughs> my camera this morning. I wasn't in position. Okay. So, so those are the two items I just wanted to mention before we get started. Now I want to make sure that okay that you can see me. Okay. All right. Good. All right. So you can see me. So those were the two items I wanted to mention before we got started. Um, I shared the readings last week during our session. So it didn't come on Monday. It was already in there uh, on uh, Saturday when we came together. 
last time. And so I'll talk a little bit about those and um, really more about the second one because I sort of covered the other document that you received uh, in real time last, last time we were together. Hello. Um, so let's see. I'm going to open it up, uh, the documents, and actually going to probably share it for you. For those of you who are watching and are not like literally looking at your documents in real time. Okay, good. So we'll read a little bit about Nkrumah. Let me see, share. Okay, share screen, start broadcast. And please forgive me, I'm sort of like, you know, uh, I'm sort of like the bare bones person. I'll say a little bit beforehand, but then, I mean, my objective is always to just jump right in, <laughs> uh, short of some of the pleasantries and things of that nature. So um, forgive me for that. So here we are, we're right at what we are aiming to do, which is uh, look at the document you have by Kwame Nkrumah, and it really is his uh, speech at Cairo Summit Conference to the Organization of African Unity in July 19th, 1964. That's great because look at, it's about how many years ago? 64, 74, 74, 84, 94, 2004, 14, 24. So this is just shy of 60 years ago, he's giving this speech, you know, so it was July 19th, today is July 1st, and we're revisiting it. Very important because, um, now I'm not gonna get into the whole speech, hopefully you read it during the course of the week, but I'm just gonna hit on a couple of points here um, that Nkrumah makes. And most of you know who Kwame Nkrumah is. Kwame Nkrumah is the, uh, first president of Ghana, right? Formerly the Gold Coast um, under the British. And he is the first uh, president uh, of Ghana. He actually was formally educated out here in the West uh, at Lincoln University, then uh, University of Pennsylvania. As I'm saying this, I'm thinking to myself uh, about an organization that I was a part of that um, subscribed to Nkrumah's philosophy, Nkrumah's terrorism, basically, it was the All African People Revolutionary Party that um, Kwame Ture uh, established. But I'm thinking because I just spoke to uh, some people, uh, cadre in that organization I hadn't spoken to in a long time. So I'm thinking about just the spirit of what Nkrumah symbolized because, you know, in 1950, I believe it's 57, Ghana is the first to get its independence. And it's, it's a, a major thing on the African continent, but Nkrumah sort of embodies the spirit of Pan-Africanism as he gives an independent speech after their struggle. And while their struggle wasn't an armed struggle in the Eastern and Southern uh, African context, right? So in East Africa and Southern Africa, you have armed struggle. And in West Africa, you have one exception uh, to the non, and I wouldn't say nonviolent because even the the countries that have just political struggles and there's a transfer of power like Ghana, there are still there are still violent clashes. Okay, but the exception in terms of uh, West Africa armed struggle was Guinea Bissau with Emil Cabral. So you saw in the presentation and I did uh, a couple of weeks ago with respect to Guinea Bissau and Emil Cabral, and I even talked you know I talked a little bit about Thomas Sankar you saw that there was um, armed struggle in Guinea-Bissau. So Guinea-Bissau is the one exception in West Africa, right? But East and Southern Africa are forced to fight for their independence uh, through armed struggle because there is a settler population. So in West Africa, you have the first independent or liberation of the a colonial African country under colonialism, and that's Ghana, 
under Nkrumah, and he talks about, or he makes it abundantly clear. My air condition is loud, so let me make sure you can hear me. Uh, he makes it abundantly clear that uh, the independence of Ghana is for naught if it does not uh, lead to the total liberation of the African continent, total liberation and unification of the African continent. And that's very important because um, he ultimately is saying we are not going to leave the masses of African countries that are suffering under European imperialism, expresses colonialism, uh, in that condition and in those in that circumstance. Now, the last thing, though, ultimately, um, I guess that Nkrumah, and he writes about it, he calls it neocolonialism, the last, the last stage of capitalism, um, or last stage of imperialism. But the, the point is, is that, you know, he could not have projected more accurately our current condition and dilemma, which is that we would have independence, we would have liberation, but now we have oppressors, we have people who oppress us, who look like us, and who are not agents for African people, and not agents for uh, African liberation, who are not agents for pan-Africanism, right? And so it puts us in a situation where the ideological training that we get in spaces like this or the ideological training that should have um, happened in those countries um, during their periods of liberation would prepare them to qualify people's behavior, qualify people's practices, right? So, you know, that's our, you know, and that brings us to our current situation, right? Where we have to assess what's happening, what people are doing, as opposed to assessing so much how they look or appear or uh, see or where they even originate. Because a person can come or a group of people or organization can originate in our communities um, with our people and not serve the best interests of our people, right? So, you know, this speech revere, revisits the spirit that was the organization of African unity during its uh, founding years and uh, what the original envision, vision and mission was, okay? So I'm just gonna open it up and then hit on a couple of points that I hope that you um, caught while you read it during the week. It wasn't that long, it's about seven, I guess about, I don't know, one, two, three, Okay, so I guess that's relative, right? Not that long. It's about 12 <laughs> or 13 pages, but you know. Okay, so um, he starts out, he says, Mr. Chairman, in the year that has passed since we met, met at Addis Ababa, an established organization of African Union, I have no reason to change my mind about the concrete proposals which I made to you then or about the reasons I gave for my conviction that only a union government can guarantee our survival. On the contrary, every hour since then, both in the world at large and on our own continent, Africa, has brought events to prove that our problems as individual states are insoluble except in the context of African unity that our security as individual states are indivisible, divisible from the security of the whole continent and that freedom of our compatriots still in foreign chains and under colonial rule awaits the redeeming might of an African continental government. And notice that he's not saying uh, a United States of Africa, very important, right? He doesn't, he never says, you know, a United States of Africa per se, but he says uh, an, an African continental government, a government that 
unifies Africa, the continent of Africa. And of course, he doesn't uh, leave out, you know, the fact that he, his spirit, that uh, his thoughts are with uh, his compatriots still in foreign chains and under colonial rule, right? So, right. So we look, we took a monumental decision at the summit meeting in, in Addis Ababa last year. No amount of disappointment or impatience with the pace at which our charter has been implemented can detract from the epic making an irrevocable nation nature of our decision to affirm the unity of our continent. Now, let me just bring this, you know, sort of together. The idea here in the context of this seminar is to look at individual proponents of Pan-Africanism as we did, uh, to look at uh, organizational bodies, which we did, and that is the conversation about you know, the first Pan-African Conference, the Pan-African Congresses, so on and so forth. The Congresses are very important. If you don't get anything in this class, you should get that, that the Congresses are responsible for uh, ultimately an organization like this coming about. And, it, and it's a beautiful commentary on the dialectical relationship. You should get that Du Bois, with all his flaws, whether you like him, you don't like him, you know, you're a fan, you're not a fan. Even though I start this course looking at Pan-Africanism sort of through Booker T. Washington, uh, Washington's eyes, an unlikely figure, Du Bois is the individual who is the survivor of that first Pan-African conference who initiates the Congresses which is the setting through which Nkrumah is here now talking about the initiation of the organization of African unity, which is the think tank through which African leadership will demand total independence and liberation of African continents. So you see how it's connected, right? These individual proponents of Pan-Africanism are on a mission. So little old Du Bois in conjunction with others carries the torch of Pan-Africanism and initiates the Congresses. Du Bois is very, in many ways, very African-American, very much. He is very invested in America. However, the beauty of it all is that he still has a vision um, and still connects with Africa. Enough to say, we've got to initiate these Congresses. And so last document you have, right? The other document in conjunction with this was the document which gave you the resolutions of the first and the fifth Pan-African Congress, which ultimately gives the setting for, for Nkrumah to be standing here, giving this speech years later in Addis on the organization of African unity, its establishment, and what this will mean for the African continent. So I hope you're getting from this lecture, the connection between us, right? The dialectical relationship, the how we are going back and forth in dialogue about what we need in this world as African people, as black people, um, or as some people wanna say as black African people, I don't care how you say it, but you know, we are African people and yes, we are identifiably black in a racialized society, right? But we're more than that, to be quite frank. So, uh, so there is a dialectical relationship. I think your, your participation in I Love Black People is indicative of this also, right? We're all in different locales, but we're coming together for the purpose of learning and strategizing around our collective condition, right? And I'm sure you understand the you understand the uh, purpose and the mission of I Love Black People, which is to uh, rid the world, which is a hefty uh, task of racism and xenophobia through the use of technology, right? So the ultimate objective is to um, address our condition 
of oppression and exploitation um, through this worldwide system called white supremacy and culture and racism. Uh, so this kind of interaction has always been in existence. Now, this gives you, on another note, this gives you an understanding and also maybe for some of you, depending on your context, it gives you a charge to possibly um, wherever you are, be aware of and in your own big or small way, influence what is happening today, which is this current organization, uh, the OAU does not exist in its raw form anymore. Now it exists in the form of the African Union. And while the African Union has done some things, and I'll tell you what they are in the last uh, almost 20 years to move towards continental unity, I, I mentioned last time that one of the negatives of the African Union whose objective was supposed to be the same as the Organization of African Union, Unity, is that 60% last time I was informed by somebody within, 60% uh, of the funding comes from the European Union, right? And, and that is a huge contradiction, right? I'm not sure that the organization, the African Union, which is meant to carry out uh, it, the vision and mission of the original entity, the OAU, the Organization of African Union, Unity, I'm not sure that it can carry out that vision and mission with 60%, over half of the funding, and it may be worse now, I don't know. Uh, coming from the European Union. I mean, I'm <laughs> right. The European Union is a body comprised of European nations that in, imperialist European nations that went into Africa and colonized the people to begin with. <laughs> so I'm not sure how that helps us, right? That today uh, they are the primary or the largest funders of the African Union, a vehicle, a body meant to carry out the original vision, vision and mission of the Organization of African Union, right? So these are things that we have to ask questions about and we have to challenge and, uh, and qualify, right? And not be afraid to make these types of critiques also. Okay, we took monument, a monumental decision. I think I read that. Yes, I did. Okay, so um, another thing, well, let me just address this little part here, right? So this is not single states or single continents which are undergoing decolonization, but the greater portion of the world. It is not one empire which is expiring, but the whole system of imperialism which is at bay. It is not individual communities, but the whole of humanity, which is demanding different and a better, demanding a different and better way of life in the world, growing millions. Great positive and social revolutions have created mighty nations and empires and that and the waves of those revolutions lap our shores, no less than they do of those other continents, great technological and industrial revolutions have transformed the economies of large portions of the world. And the waves of those revolutions will not stop short of the continent of Africa. A revolution in communication, communications brings knowledge of every change in the world to the remotest corners of our continent. The world will not wait, nor will it move, move step by step, however much we may wish this. So let me say something about what was going on at this moment in time, 1964, when Nkrumah is giving this speech. Nkrumah is sharply aware that in 1962 and 1963, on the African continent, there were 17 
nations, African nations that took their territories, their countries back from colonial regimes. And, you know, people love to, in the contemporary context, talk about all oh, the Arab Spring, this spring. Listen, there has never probably been a history in the history of or an account of in the modern world where 17 nations <laughs> in two years time take and overthrow and kick out colonial regimes and give and, and give the country back to the people that happened on the african continent and had it happened anywhere else we would still be talking about it because it is a a, a phenomenal thing and so this is sort of what he is speaking to, to give you some historical context to what was happening. This is 1964, and this is on the heels of this, you know, revolution on the African continent, 17 African nations taking their independence uh, in two years, okay? So he's speaking to that, and he's saying, there's nothing you can do. Revolution is happening all over the world, and it is happening here too, on the African continent. And, um, and of course, after that, there would be more until ultimately the continent of Africa is liberated from the traditional colonial expressions, right? We weren't prepared about neocolonialism. We weren't prepared for neocolonialism because we were fighting our way out of traditional colonialism on the continent. And so... Uh, this is Nkrumah's response to it, that it is something that you could not, it's like the waves <laughs> for the shore. It's not, you can't hold it back. It is the natural order of things, right? So um, it's, it's, it's going to come. So ultimately, uh, you know, that is what happened. Oh, the, the independence is um, gained by most of Africa, most African countries. However, um, what we were, like I said, unprepared for was this new revised <laughs> remix version of colonialism, which was neo-colonialism, where we have colonialism expressed in blackface ultimately. Okay. Uh, so I just want to, um, I wanna, I'm gonna come off of here. I'm not gonna hit too many more points. I'm gonna come off of here. Uh, and I wanna say, just give you a couple of other thoughts, right? Uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about was, oh, okay. All right, I'm back. <laughs> one of the things I wanted to talk about was um, how, what has happened in the last 20 years uh, that was not happening at this moment in time, that things that were carried about out by the African Union that were progressive, because I don't want to just, you know, make you feel down or <laughs> there are things that are happening. There are things that have taken place, right? And, and those, some of those things that has happened, that have happened since, uh, this moment in time on behalf or initiated by the African Union in spite of its contradiction of being funded by a um, anti-African force <laughs> being the European Union uh, is one, the unified African passport, which hasn't fully been activated, but wasn't in existence uh, 20 years ago. So this has happened, right? Then there is the, uh, then there is the um, uh, regional consolidation of currency in certain places. Okay, that's another thing that has happened. Um, then there also has been what else? Oh, the Pan African Free Trade right, which did not exist at this time. And that has happened in the last 10 or 15 years um, by the African, initiated by the African Union. So those are some positive things that are on the table and have been pushed to fruition to a, some extent uh, by the African Union in an attempt to carry out the original vision and mission 
of the OAU, right? And those are powerful things, meaning that the African passport, and it has not fully been uh, realized for all of Africa, but it does exist and, and it's, you know, it's in the process, right? Uh, that will give us the opportunity to move around the African continent free of issues of crossing borders, right? You know, so this will eliminate the colonial lines and borders that Europeans drew and that mean ultimately nothing to African people, okay? And then, uh, I'm seeing comments. Okay, I'm gonna to get to the comments because every time I click on the comments, it changes my screen <laughs> for some reason. But I'm gonna look at your comments. Uh, and then you have, of course, the Pan-African free trade, right? Or fair trade, um, free or fair trade uh, across the borders. And that's a positive. One negative though, I can quickly think of is that, you know, the uh, the African Union headquarters was gifted to the African Union by China. Very problematic. Uh, so, you know, things of that nature. So the, the struggle continues, right? And I think part of, uh, you know, our collective struggle is to make ourselves aware, acutely aware, and to prepare ourselves um, to act in big and small ways in the interest of um, African people. I'm going to get your comments. Are you aware of PAPSS, Pan African Payment and Settlement System? No, I'm not. A cross border financial market infrastructure. Oh, wow. Okay. No, I'm not. I am not. But thank you. And I'm going <laughs> to save that information. No, I, I'm not aware of that. Thank you for bringing that to my attention, Curtis Murphy. Um, correct you, particularly France Pay. So, the, yes. Isn't that a shame? Uh, Sissy Mon. Iman. Uh, and then one of the issues with um, yes, I was a part of a conference in 2004 that when Gaddafi was the president uh, of the African Union, um, or the chair of the African Union, he, I was a part of a conference where he brought 500 African intellectuals from around the world to give recommendations to the African Union to help move us towards a more unified Africa. And this was the first time, you know, the diaspora was recognized as a region and part of uh, the African family and continent, right? So we were uh, the fifth or sixth region as they would call it. And so we had a com committee as well, working committee that gave recommendations. So that conference that I was a part of was called the first conference of intellectuals for Africa and the diaspora. And it's so funny, they sent it to uh, Brazil, the Brazilians derailed it and uh, made it about their geopolitical issues in the regions. And this is what uh, this is what neo-colonial leadership in Africa does when they want to kill an African agenda. And I know this from the inside, when they want to kill uh, an African agenda, they send it to South America because they know it will cease to be about Africa and it will only be about their, you know, aspirations or their, their process of becoming Black. Okay, I just like to say it, but it's a fact. It, it, in that conference in uh, 2006, the whole agenda to gather recommendations and consciously move towards a unified Africa was tabled. That conference, the CA, was tabled and postponed for 10 years. Now, fast forward, it's more than 10 years later, and that agenda has not resumed, right? 
So just FYI, when African leadership that is of the neo-colonial brand wants to kill an African agenda, South America is the perfect place because South Americans are still struggling to be black and certainly are not conscious of being um, African. I'm sorry, you know, that's just what it is. They're still hopefully on the, we've been saying they're on the brink of their, you know, black power movement or their, you know, uh, their, their collective transformation in terms of black power for years. I have yet to see that black power movement really manifest, but I'm waiting and I'm, I'm like on the other side, happy to receive them, but you know, it's um, knowing you're black is good. Um, realizing that you are African is and connected to the, and that our fate is bound up with Africa is a whole other story. And um, they're they're just not there yet. So sorry, but they're not. Uh, so thank you for your word about Gaddafi. Absolutely, Gaddafi was on point, and that's why he was assassinated. Oh, well, you can um, OPP something, ask questions in this chat. That's where, where you ask chat questions. Sorry, the um, moderator, like we cannot uh, facilitate, you know, like allowing everybody to verbally ask questions, but you can certainly write your questions in here and I will try to communicate. Hello, uh, Emmanuel. Thank you, I'm happy you're excited. Okay. Hello, hello, Isaac. Hello. I, Joseph, I'm, I'm going to say the name that I can pronounce, right? Because I don't want to uh, mispronounce your name. Okay. Uh, so, Sis Iman, if you're part of the group, um, you should be able to see the Pan-African document. I don't know what it is. Are you actually a part of, officially a part of the course? If you are, I shared them in, um, the tel in Telegram. So you actually already have it in PDF form. Now, if you're not officially a part of the group, then you wouldn't have seen it, but register for our next cycle so you can get all the reading materials and documents, okay? Please, that's sis, Sister Iman, okay? I Listen, I'm not like Nana Okua, she emails everybody. That is wonderful, but listen, I am not as well organized on that level and, and I have multiple email boxes and it's a lot for me to keep up with all of them. So I definitely could never like, you know, teach this and uh, individually email people and respond. My, my email boxes are shameful. I'm just going to be honest with you. So uh, all the materials that I share in here are shared through the, what, well, our telegram. Um, course, you know, so our course in Telegram, where I share all of the materials, you know, that I said you should compile and keep. Okay, so Yvonne, do you see this um, person here? Uh, Sister Iman, she's the last comment on here. Can you um, communicate with her in a way where she can uh, register for our next cycle yes okay and curtis murphy is saying how do i contact on telegram it, are you currently in the actual course mr murphy that person too can you communicate with them so that they can get in the next cycle because it seems like they're here on the lecture but they're not actually in the course So she will communicate with you. Thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Um, okay, you're going faster, but can you please allow us to ask questions? 
Okay, can you type into the session here? Uh, if you're here in the Zoom session, then you should be able to type a question in. That is the way in which we take questions. <laughs> okay. Um, Okay, so Curtis Murphy, Yvonne, our administrator, she's going to communicate with you. All right, try, try to join. Uh, Yvonne, do you see their comments here? Yeah, yes. Okay, good. So Yvonne, our administrator, she's going to communicate with you because she's on that end of of our program and she will communicate, okay? And help you uh, sign up for our next cycle. Okay, so Joseph, what is your opinion? What in your opinion should the African, should the Africans do to get off this financial dependence and get off the EU support? I believe that African has been hijacked and then Okay, so that's your question. Thank you. It's a very good question. Um, and then I'll look at Sister Iman's question. Uh, great question, Joseph. So what do I think should be done? I think one of the biggest issues for the African continent and for every African community, and I touched on this in the context of our you know, last several weeks, which is the fact that we are used, us as a people, as extraction sites and our communities are used as extraction sites for resources, human and otherwise, every single place, everywhere we are, uh, we are utilized in that way. And it's very unfortunate. What do I think? So in spite of what some people believe, I don't tailor this course to my book on Washington and Africa, However, I actually do believe, those of you who are familiar with the, a book that I wrote, I do believe what's in that book, that it's independence through industry and what allows Africa in particular to be exploited is the fact that we don't have industries. We don't own the industries that exist there. We have the resources are below our feet, but we don't own and operate uh, the industries foreign nationals of the European persuasion own those industries, factories, so on and so forth. And, and, and we produce the raw goods, they take them, they reduce or they uh, negate the, the, the market value or they devalue it, let me say it that way, they devalue uh, our raw products, it gets shipped outside and it is bagged or boxed and processed in Western factories or in factories in Africa that are owned and operated by other people and then shipped right back to us and around the world. And they engage in uh, true and blue capitalism where they essentially have super profits and we ultimately are exploited in the process. How do, so stay with me. How do we um, change that? Well, one, Congo, I, I love to say this, in the last two years, the Congo actually came out, said we're not going to allow uh, foreign nationals to extract or mine some of the most important resources in this region. Um, we're not going to allow it. I don't want to say Cobalt Cote because I don't remember which one it was. It was one of the two. And this is highly sought after, right? Uh, I, I communicated this, or we talked about this a couple of sessions ago. The Congo said, no, 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 no foreign nationals mining or, or um, drilling or <laughs> extracting anything over here. Now, you know, it's not gonna be uh, pretty because there's one place in the world, it's not South America, it's not Europe, it's not, uh, Eastern Europe, it's not Asia. There's one place on this earth that the world cannot live without, and that is Africa. OK? 
Okay. Africa is sustainable for African people. And Africa is also uh, the sustaining force of the world on many levels. Even the technology, you all know this. I'm not telling you anything. Even the technology that we use right now. What shifts all of this for us is um, African leadership, not neo-colonial African leadership, African leadership that is for African people uh, saying no more using our country, our communities, our people as extraction sites or share resources to benefit other people. That's what it takes. Um, yeah, that's what it takes, period, period. And then that forces the African Union to fall in line, uh, you know, and maybe, just maybe, as we do that, we create another entity that is more true to the vision and mission of the OAU. We can do that. We don't have to put up with the African Union, to be quite frank with you. We don't. We don't have to deal with them. We don't have to uh, even recognize it. We can say, Here's a new body. Here's a new entity that's going to represent the interest of the collective interest of the African continent and its people. We can do that, right? We're the most creative <laughs> and probably the bravest people on this earth. I mean, we can do that. That's what I think. How do I contact on Telegram? I, uh, Yvonne, please help. Uh, I think you download the app, Telegram, and then you add it. You you ask to be a part of this course, and then and and then you will it will show up in your queue, I believe, somehow. Now, how can we as an upcoming generation do to get back track to? Um, well, this is a start right here, right? I mean. You know, you start with yourself and then you move outward, individually, organizationally, community, nation, continent, right? So I think in this course, we've covered a lot of those points individually, you know, organizationally, right? International organization, continent, you know, nation, continent, so... So to answer your question, uh, we do that by studying, so we know what to do, right? And then we, then then we do it in the, you know, we do it in the way that I just mentioned, right? Individually, collect, you know, organizationally. You know, you're a part of organization. Well, what what's their position on Africa? What's their position on our condition in the world? And any organization you're a part of, they should have a position on our condition. It's and if they don't, then you need to find another organization. Right, because any organization. Let me just say this, because I don't talk about religion, and I and I stay far away from it. But if you're a part of any group, even if it's a religious group that can't deal with your actual condition, then that's not for you. Move to another entity. Move to another group or organization. Okay, uh, I I subscribe completely and wholly to the Adam Clayton Power Seat Powell Senior and junior to a large extent, ideology and philosophy do not have our people come organizationally participate in, in anything and ignore their condition and their suffering. And, and, and people who see themselves as leadership and do that, they are hypocrites. And you need to get away from that organization or that entity. Okay, I know a man, I'm gonna just say this. I know a man who uh, was, is a member of, or was a member of a church family. And the, the leader of this church family was a non-African person, non-Black person, was a Caucasian person. And, but this individual was leading a men's group. And I said, you know, well, me leading a men's group in a pri primarily black church, but with white leadership to a large extent is um, interesting at the least, right? 
I asked a few more questions. I said, well, with all that's going on, even in the last two years, do you all ever being a black men's group, being primarily a men's group, but primarily comprised of black men, do you uh, talk about the condition and plight of black men specifically, but black people collectively? And he said, no. And I said, sorry, forgive me, but your pastor is a hypocrite because there is no way that you can be a part of any organized body and be there suffering under the collective condition of the group you come from. And that organization has no agenda, no position, nothing to tell you, nothing to offer you that you need to get far away from them. They do not represent you or your interest. So whatever organization it is, I don't care if it's you know a checkers group or whatever it is, a chess group club. What what do you have some position or you know on on the membership's reality? <laughs> okay, they should they should because to not have a position on the condition of the people that are contributing in organized fashion to their organization is to negate their humanity. And I'm going further, I'm going way over time. So wait, I, the sister Iman, I, I skipped her question and went to, um, okay. Okay, all right. So I see what you wrote. Curtis Murphy, I don't understand all of it, but okay. How do you, I get your book. Um, Your book, my book is called Book to Washington in Africa, The Making of a Pan-Africanist. It's, um, you can go to the website. It was sold out, so like we, there was gonna, it's wait a week, okay? But um, the website is, Booker T. Washington in Africa dot com. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome, Joseph. Um, okay, so Yvonne should have answered you, Curtis Murphy, download the app and then send a message to I Love Black People to be in the next cycle. Yes, he joined uh, the group already. Okay. Uh, can you please account for why did the Organization of African Unity fail on account that Africa was having great leaders that can track the idea of unity? It is simplicity. Were there are some individuals who were in a separate? Uh, read the document that I shared, or you'll learn about it in the next, I don't embellish it, but it was a Monrovian group. There were, there was some divisiveness in the organization of African unity to a large extent. There were two groups involved in the OAU. I don't really give a whole lot of light to it, but if you read the document I shared uh, uh, by Nkrumah right now in this speech, he actually addresses that, right? The two factions within the organization of organization of African unity, the the, uh, the Monrovian group and the uh, Casablanca group. Anyway, okay. Okay, so I answered that question and then this was Sister Iman's question. I finally made it in, do you know that and kind of. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh no, I didn't know that she was organizing an eighth Pan African Congress. Oh, okay. No, I did hear of that. Okay, but I didn't know that's what she was calling. Or that's what it was calling. I would love to, um, you know, connect directly with Doctor. Arakan Twa. I think she is brave. She is one of the few people who is 
you know, unbought, unbossed, <laughs> as you would say, uh, telling the truth, you know. Yeah, and not owned, you know, she's not owned, so she can afford to tell the truth. Yes, African American, right, her organization. So I didn't know it was being called. I know it was supposed to be something this past April, but now, okay, it's being, it's later on in the year. So I think that that's huge. And I'm going to try to stay abreast of that because I heard talk of this last year. I didn't know that it was being called uh, the Eighth Pan African Congress. All right, but I think that's good. And it's in Zimbabwe, sure. Um, All right, thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed the lecture. Yes, see, Chris, I uh, mean, right, exactly. You know, it's, listen, I love my brothers and sisters in, in, in that part of the world. However, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, we're waiting for them on this side, right? It's one thing to know you're Black. It's another thing to know that you're a child of Africa. Um, and without a doubt, Africa is the seat of our power. It's the seat of our liberation. America is not. South America is not. Uh, Europe is not. Asia is not. Okay? So, you know, there you have it. And I know some people, they get a little confused with that kind of dynamic down there. But, you know, we are not in this space, <laughs> right? And colorism, right. Colorism is a big issue in the United States. And so it definitely is in, in uh, Central and South America, right? So they have all these, I call them, you know, micro identities that still, you know, connect the, you know, that basically, locate them closer or further from um, uh, whiteness and, and blackness, right? And I know, I get it. I know the whole conversation. We think about race differently. No, no, you don't. You do not think about race differently. White is still on top in your society and black is still on the bottom. What's different about that? There's nothing different about that. There, that is exactly uh, what it is all over the world. So that is not an exceptional way about thinking about race. And matter of fact, yeah, it is an exceptionally um, backwards way to think about the racial paradigm, which is meaning you're in the same family and you're, you're all racially different. You know, <laughs> this thing, this construct called race that was created by these very young people. Um, and I'm talking about young people, talking about Europeans, um, has us crazy, to be quite frank, because it's not real, right? Race is not real. Culture is very real. Culture is how we live every day. Culture is connected to our real values, our core values and principles. Culture will always be real. <laughs> Race will never be real in the scientific sense. Okay, but people act on it. So what does that tell you, right? That is, it's on the pathological end because you're acting on something that cannot really scientifically be proven. Thank you, thank you, Curtis Murphy. Um, oh, okay, thank you, thank you. Hold on, let me, let me see. Okay, so thank you, Sister Iman. All right, hold on. <laughs> All right. Okay. Oh, great. Oh, wonderful, Sistema. All right, thank you. 
Yes, yes, Curtis Murphy. I mean, we've been fooled. We've been bamboozled, like Malcolm said, you know. In World War One, let me just just to drive home that point. Oh my goodness, that's so funny, uh, Joseph. You say why so many? <laughs> yes, Caucasians coming to uh, Africa because they know what the rest of the world has been fooled about, which is that Africa is the seat of power in the world it's just what it is yeah now there's hardly any african americans but there is over a half a million you know at least as recent as a decade ago of african americans who expatriated to the continent africa but they propagandize in a way to keep uh you know us off of the continent although i you know i lived in west africa um, for a time I was about to say something else, but I've forgotten now. So, um, context, okay. Oh, uh, sister and mom, mom, how do I contact this individual, right? I don't, you told me to contact them, but I don't know how to contact them. I mean, What is the dedication that those in the diaspora had for the cause of Africa as per now? I mean, the dedication, I don't know. I mean, I do think that there are some of us here who will still hold true to what you see in this speech that we looked at today. Um, in Kruma's speech, this idea, this idea that Africa for Black people and African people around the world is the seat of power. Right. So just in the same way that we recognize that there were some things that happened in Africa that um, precipitated our arrival to the West, Western Hemisphere, there are some things that can happen in Africa that extends power to us in the diaspora and around the world. Okay. No worries, uh, Sister Iman. I can I can find out. I have some connections. I, don't worry about it. <laughs> okay. Um, any reading assignments for next week? I think are we, Yvonne, Is this our last session? Yes, this is the last one. This is our last session. I think it allows you to still uh, access it or something like that. But I think this is our last session. So there's no more reading. We're leaving on a high point. You know with uh, the message from Nkrumah, you know, and the fact that, listen, we already done what nobody has ever done, liberate 17 African countries in, uh, in, uh, in a year. I don't know if you guys can see my cat, but he, he, he's, uh, he wants to be a part of the session. Anyway, okay. I have to go, but um, I'm already over. Thank you very much. Um, but we are in the global body of people, all parts, you know, what part do you think has important to Oh, no. So when you talk about uh, Murphy, uh, oh, okay. I think you, Curtis, you're talking to the other individuals. Other, okay. So, well, my answer to you, what you just posed, the question you just posed, Curtis, is that, you know, yes, Africa is the part that can't be replaced, <laughs> right? All this other stuff, you know, our arrival out here and all that kind of stuff, we are, uh, we are intricately linked to the African continent, whether we want to see it that way or not, right? So Africa rises in power, then we all rise because that becomes the seat of power, except for those who say, you're not African or you're not black and you have no connection, then okay, you know, whatever. We're not mad at those people. Let them go do what they want and let them, let whoever they identify with cover them. <laughs> you know, I'm all for that. You know, there's one less head to worry about. Uh, hmm. 
well, I think those of us, uh, you know, those in Africa, those of us who identify with Africa still want to see a unified Africa because we know the power of a unified Africa, um, I restate again, reverberates throughout the world for us. They practice in balance, right? <laughs> right. They have a big, right. Uh, Emmanuel, yeah, they, they, you know, tabula rasa, right? They have this uh, tablet where they consciously, you know, direct each other to improve the race, right? Absolutely. Um, and listen, we got that pathology in our families here too, but it's just not in a very, in, in a uh, calculated way, you know, not in a, a conscious, um, you know, here's the tablet, you know, get closer to whiteness, uh, conscious and deliberate, intentional um, thing like it is in that part of the world. So, you know, but, but we got it, right? Um, all right, so I'm gonna go because there'll always be more questions. Um, thank you all very much. All right, thank you. I see the uh, email. Uh, thank you very much, Sister Iman. Thank you all for uh, loving African and Black people with action and, and giving your time to I love Black people, okay? And coming through the process. All right, thank you all. Well, that was it right there. Thank you. Love us through action. We need so much. <laughs> so your participation in I Love Black People is you know, how to do that. Okay. To love us through action. All right. Hold on one second. Yvonne, don't cut us off yet. She gave me another email address. <laughs> all right. All right. Thank you. Um, all right. Thank you, everyone. I am because we are. Yes, sir. I thank am because we are. Yes, thank you, uh, Dr. Wright, for this wonderful lecture. Yes, I am because we are. Happy New Month. And uh, thank you.